It's a brand new day here at MPS and our future is bright. We're proud of our school system and all of our accomplishments. Together, we're moving forward. And we're not stopping. We are one. We are strong. We are MPS. to say that I am truly grateful for the blessings that have fallen upon me and I'd like to say that I received over 1.3 million in scholarship and have, and have been accepted to over 21 institutions. I chose NYU and I'll be attending NYU this fall with a major in film and a minor in business. I chose NYU due to the fact that I will be trained in a media-based environment surrounded by artists like me and innovative professors who are just committed to producing the next generation of storytellers and community builders. I'm having to get used to the big C, you know, the big alpha, and the screaming with the cold weather, but I know deep down in my heart that NYU is my home and where the place where I should be. Center Park Crossing has also helped me um, find my passion and just find my worth. Through every hall, through every door and every corner, you can find greatness at Park Crossing. You can also find teachers and staff members who just want their students to succeed and just want the best for them in life. Well, eight years ago, in a matter of minutes, I went from being a child to a child caregiver. I spent years bathing, feeding, exercising, and you know, just receiving and giving medication to my grandmother and uncle. And my grandmother actually inspired me to um, apply to college before she had passed. And my uncle passed before my senior year as well. And I just felt down and I just stopped believing in myself. But over the summer, I had to put my crown back on and just build up my confidence. And I remember this one quote that my grandmother, grandmother used to always tell me, a clenched fist cannot plant a seed, meaning that in order for me to grow, prosper, and thrive, I must first open my hands out to the numerous opportunities that are falling beneath me. And I would play that quote over and over again in my head until it became my drive, my energy, and my motivation. I just want to give a voice to the voiceless and defend those who are defenseless. I just want to be the change that I want to see in today's society for a better tomorrow. First, it feels awesome, amazing, um, but I'm also very honored just to be in this position because I represent not just myself, but I represent a team of teachers, my administrators, and it is an overwhelmingly joyous feeling right now. I have been teaching for a total of 20 years here at Seth Johnson for about 12 years, and I've been here. I am now under a new leadership. This school is one of the best places because of the students, the community, and everything that we do together. My team has stood behind me on many things. When I'm able to bring my passion, because I am very passionate about it, 
I'm passionate about not just science, but reading, math, all of the subjects, because you can teach across the curriculum. Isolated teaching is not something that is going to help these students become successful. So at the end of the day, I am here for their success. And if they see that I'm passionate about it, I feel like they will also become engaged and motivated and want to explore that. As I mentioned before, everyone has a different learning mode. You have to be able to tap into all of those different modalities. And when you present it in a way, then you know that you're inclusive of everyone. Everyone has something to contribute. Everyone in that classroom has a contribution. And when I show up, I want to make sure that they know that I recognize it, but I also want them to recognize it. And at the end of the day, it's for student success. And that could be academically, physically, emotionally, socially. It's just not about academics all the time. The content is important, but we have to teach the whole child. I think her secret is treating her students like she treat her own. Her incorporation of project-based learning helps the students relate their current curriculum to real life experiences. A lot of times when I go into her room to observe and they're doing a project, they're having fun and I realize and they really learn it. It's not like how when I was in school, the teacher stood in front of the classroom, the only manipulative that we used was the little counters. Now they are actually doing experiments and they're working and they're loving it. The students are excited about going in her classroom. I'm excited about going in her classroom. It's an honor to have Mrs. King as a member of our faculty. Um, she is one of the many great teachers we have at Johnson. Um, we are one of the best kept secrets and it's just a pleasure to have her here and representing Montgomery Public Schools as the 21-22 Teacher of the Year. It's a brand new day here at MPS, and our future is bright. We're proud of our school system and all of our accomplishments. Together, we're moving forward. And we're not stopping. We are one. We are strong. We are MPS. to say that I am truly grateful for the blessings that have fallen upon me and I would like to say that I received over 1.3 million in scholarship and have, and have been accepted to over 21 institutions. I chose NYU and I'll be attending NYU this fall with a major in film and a minor in business. I chose NYU due to the fact that I will be trained in a media-based environment surrounded by artists like me and innovative professors who are just committed to producing the next generation of storytellers and community builders. I'm had to get used to the big C, you know, the big alpha, and extremely the cold weather, but I know deep down in my heart that NYU is my home and where the place where I should be. Center Park Crossing has also helped me um, find my passion and just find my worth. Through every hall, through every door and every corner, you can find greatness at Park Crossing. You can also find teachers and staff members who just want their students to succeed and just want the best for them in life. Well, eight years ago, in a matter of minutes, I went from being a child to a child caregiver. I spent years bathing, feeding, exercising, and, you know, just receiving and giving medication to my grandmother. 
and uncle. And my grandmother actually inspired me to um, apply to college before she had passed. And my uncle passed before my senior year as well. And I just felt down and I just stopped believing in myself. But over the summer, I had to put my crown back on and just build up my confidence. And I remember this one quote that my grandmother, grandmother used to always tell me, a clenched fist cannot plant a seed. Meaning that in order for me to grow, prosper, and thrive, I must first open my hands out to the numerous opportunities that are falling beneath me. And I would play that quote over and over again in my head until it became my drive, my energy, and my motivation. I just want to give a voice to the voiceless and defend those who are defenseless. I just want to be the change that I want to see in today's society for a better tomorrow. Well, first, it feels awesome, amazing, um, but I'm also very honored just to be in this position because I represent not just myself, but I represent a team of teachers, my administrators, and it is an overwhelmingly joyous feeling right now. I have been teaching for a total of 20 years here at Seth Johnson for about 12 years and I've been here. I am now under a new leadership. This school is one of the best places because of the students, the community, and everything that we do together. My team has stood behind me on many things. When I'm able to bring my passion, because I am very passionate about it, I'm passionate about not just science, but reading, math, all of the subjects because you can teach across the curriculum. Isolated teaching is not something that is going to help these students become successful. So at the end of the day, I am here for their success. And if they see that I'm passionate about it, I feel like they will also become engaged and motivated and want to explore that. As I mentioned before, everyone has a different learning mode. You have to be able to tap into all of those different modalities. And when you present it in a way, then you know that you're inclusive of everyone. Everyone has something to contribute. Everyone in that classroom has a contribution. And when I show up, I want to make sure that they know that I recognize it, but I also want them to recognize it. And at the end of the day, it's for student success. And that could be academically, physically, emotionally, socially, it's just not about academics all the time. The content is important, but we have to teach the whole child. I think her secret is treating her students like she treat her own. Her incorporation of project-based learning helps the students relate their current curriculum to real life experiences. A lot of times when I go into her room to observe and they're doing a project, they're having fun and I realize and they really learn it. It's not like how when I was in school, the teacher stood at the front of the classroom. The only manipulative that we used was the little counters. Now they are actually doing experiments and they're working and they're loving it. The students are excited about going in her classroom. I'm excited about going in her classroom. It's an honor to have Mrs. King as a member of our faculty. Um, she is one of the many great teachers we have at Johnson. Um, we are one of the best kept secrets and it's just a pleasure to have her here and representing Montgomery Public Schools as the 21-22 Teacher of the Year. There we go. Good evening. Thank you for being here tonight. This is our fourth and final uh, superintendent interview. Tonight we have Dr. Donald Warren of McDonough, Georgia. He has served as the uh, deputy superintendent of Griffin uh, Spalding County Schools in Georgia. 
Prior to that, he served a term as a, the interim superintendent in the same system, and before that, uh, as the director, executive director of secondary education. He has a long and, and storied uh, career. We're looking forward to hearing from, from, from him. Uh, lots of thank yous. Uh, we want to thank Carver for, for hosting us tonight and especially the Carver Culinary Arts uh, portion which will have a nice reception for us after this is completed and we invite everybody to join us in the foyer for that. want to thank the uh, chamber, the city, the county and the business community all for helping us uh, get to this point. And with that, I think we are ready to begin this interview with me. And I know everybody's introduced themselves. I have not this whole time. I'm Claire Wheel. I represent District yes, 2. Yes, ma'am. Um, tell us how your previous experiences have prepared you to be superintendent in this school system, and what are your strengths in fiscal management? Okay. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me here today. It's an honor and a privilege to be a finalist. Um, my previous experience as a teacher, I was a middle school and high school mathematics teacher um, down in Houston County, Georgia, Warner Robins, Georgia. Um, from there, I got into school administration. I was a assistant principal at both the elementary school and middle school level um, in Houston County as well. Um, I finished my career in Houston County about 16 years, my last 10.5 years there, as a principal of Warner Robins Middle School. Um, it was a very, very diverse middle school of about 900 to 1,000 students. When I first went there, it was um, non-title, 32% poverty rate. When I finished there two and a half years later, it was Title I, 68% poverty rate. Um, did some great things. We made AYP eight consecutive years. When I left there, our school grade from the state was a B. That was the first year of grading in Georgia. And I left um, Houston County, which has 28,000 students in um, 32 schools, to move to Henry County, South Metro Atlanta. In Henry County, I was the director of teaching and learning for five years, where I supervised academic coordinators, special learning director. And we did some great things to increase the graduation rate as well as to expand the number of schools that received Title I funding. We included more um, middle schools and high schools because it's all about equity, getting students what they need. And they were able to use that money to provide resources to support instruction in those schools and professional learning for teachers. Um, from Henry County, um, again, 42,000 students in Henry County, uh, 52 schools, a very large school district. I moved to my current school district, Griffin Spalding. Griffin Spalding has about 10,000 students, 18 schools, and three programs. My first four years in Griffin Spalding, I was the um, executive director of secondary education. In that capacity, I supervised all of the middle and high school principals, and I worked closely with our secondary counselors. Um, during that time there, we also were, were fortunate to increase graduation rate and also establish transition frameworks to help support students and their parents from transitioning from elementary school to middle school and middle school to high school. Actually, last school year in Griffin, um, I was the interim superintendent. Um, there, Mr. Smith, uh, Superintendent of the District, retired, so there was a gap between his retirement and the school district hiring a permanent superintendent. So I was honored to be asked by Board of Education to be the interim superintendent, which I, which I did for four months. And I'm gonna tell you, uh, it was from like mid-November to the end of February of 2021. Being a superintendent in a, in a pandemic is a, is a challenging task. So I, I take credit, those four months give me credit for one full year. <laughs> but it, it, it was a doozy, we went through a lot. We went through a lot. So um, by all accounts, I did a pretty good job as interim superintendent. And um, our new superintendent, Dr. Simmons, promoted me to be his deputy superintendent. So um, this is my first full year as deputy superintendent where I'm number two in command in the school district, supervise various divisions, departments, and um, I'm his right-hand man, so to speak. Um, I've also 
um, completed several professional learning programs, one at Harvard University on urban um, school leadership, as well as in Georgia, we have a two-year program, the Georgia Superintendent's Professional Development Program. So all of that, along with my life and community experiences, building relationships, have um, prepared me to be a superintendent. And I would love to be the superintendent here in, uh, in MPS. Related to my strengths for uh, fiscal management, um, I know fiscal management from a school level. When I was at Howson County, I managed a Title I budget and around $360,000 in Title I. There's a lot of compliance that you need to follow, and I made certain that we dotted every I and crossed every T uh, to provide um, smart boards, clickers, and things that nature for, for classrooms, um, pay for PL services as well, all done according to our, um, our policy and regulations for federal programming. That's the school level. At the district level, uh, as director of teacher learning in, in Henry County, um, I inherited um, some coordinators that, you know, things were not done financially as they should have been according to policy. So I got with our uh, finance director, our CFO, and we um, put together some training that we trained everyone on um, purchase orders, um, requesting um, quotes and things of that nature. Um, bidding things out to make certain everybody, first of all, was educated and informed about the policies. And then they signed off on it, and we held them accountable for that. Um, so that was done during my, my first year there in Henry County, where I managed a budget, depending upon the year and the funding, um, in the range of four to nine million dollars each year. And that training was a recurring training that was done um, in July. Our fiscal year in Georgia starts in July. So each July, we did it again and, and added in new information. At the district level also, um, I helped support our CFO, um, Mr. Jones, back home, in that um, from various division departments and schools have specialized requests depending upon their student body. They submit budgets to us, and we put everything together, and, and we provide um, three options for our Board of Education. Um, three columns, um, a good, better, best. Good, better, best. Um, so the board can pick and choose what they would like out of, out of those columns. So we were fortunate last year using that process that the board voted, voted and approved the best column. And that was fantastic. They gave us the necessary support and personnel so that our um, organizational chart could properly support our district strategic plan. Also in this position, um, Myself and our HR director are accountable for um, analyzing and reviewing the, the audits of our schools, the local school accounts. So um, every school account is sent to me, I review it, and I meet with principals when needed for issues to address um, the proper management of their school budgets. So that walks you through my fiscal experience from um, school building principal as well as district office and the big item is preparing our, our district budget. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Warren, I'm Cassandra Brown, and I represent District 4 in the Montgomery mm -hmm. Public School System. And <clears throat> I'd like for you to share with us mm -hmm. uh, your experience in facilities, management, and construction. Um, you may be well aware that um, MPS is going through uh, some plans to uh, have new schools built, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of things uh, and activities around that. And we would like to know, um, how would you approach this if you were selected um, superintendent, as these would be very large projects to be managed? Yes, ma'am. I was able to watch um, some of your latest board meetings. I recall the one from March 8th, where I think the representative from Volker, the program manager, gave um, a report on the project calendar and had it phased out, I want to say 23 or 24. Um, I saw that um, a recurring item on the list were um, elementary school gyms. Come and find out, obviously, they don't have gyms, so they, they would be built. I'm certain the kids and uh, faculty staff would appreciate that and parents. Um, in my current role as deputy superintendent, I oversee our facilities and maintenance department. 
So I'm aware of, of the, the work, the bidding, and whatnot that goes into that. I'll take you back uh, to a school level. As principal in Houston County, I had one of the two oldest middle schools in the district. And my third year there, uh, we went through a total remodeling plus the addition of a brand new wing. That work spanned a year and a half. And I tell you, um, it, was a, it was a journey. Uh, moving classroom to different wings uh, because of construction, as well as uh, coming up with duty station to keep everyone safe and out of harm's way, rewriting traffic, it, it was a doozy. I mean, if you look at the, the before and after, you, it looks like totally different schools. Our office area was even moved. It was a total makeover. But um, yet, and, yet and still, um, what I focused on as a principal was um, providing strong t um, teaching and learning in every classroom, despite the construction. It's about student achievement. Also, I was very appreciative, and I think it should happen everywhere. Um, before plans are made, um, the, the, the planners, architects, school district officials, and, and facilities maintenance need to go by and spend some time with the students, parents, administration of that school to be certain their input is included in, in the planning part. So that's, that's as, a, as a principal. Um, district level, I can share with you a situation. Um, in Griffin, we have a college and career academy, and um, we have several different pathways there. Aviation, welding, healthcare, film production, as a lot of movies and films made in the Atlanta area, and Griffin and where I live, they're, they're in South Metro. Um, we wanted to enhance our aviation program, and we came up with the right idea. Our career academy um, was, was made in a former middle school, two-story middle school that was repurposed. So we had this old gym, it was raggedy, uh, but it was there. <laughs> the exterior was good, it was brick, you know, it was there. So we decided um, that Oracle and I, what if we make that an FFA approved hangar, you know? What if we were to do that? So first thing we did, we got with our director of facilities and maintenance and the superintendent, and we looked at the SPLOS that we were in. Uh, fortunately for us, that SPLOS was the highest revenue generating SPLOS in, in the history of Spalding County. So we actually had an extra funding available to do something with. And in Georgia, I don't know about Alabama, we sort of we try to write, write um, SPLOS sort of vague to, to give yourself some leeway, so if you write it, Specific, then you're tied to that and, and you're stuck. So the SPLOS was written in a vague manner and delivered some, some latitude. So the money was there in the SPLOS. So um, Dr. Irv and I visited a couple of technical colleges in Georgia that have FFA approved hangars, got an idea what it involved, got some architects um, to give us some blueprints and whatnot. And um, we presented it to our Board of Education and they jumped on 100%. They were like, we want this, we want it yesterday. So it was very um, good for us. We went through, um, our director of facilities did, you know, getting the bids and quotes and things of that nature, RFP, RFPs, and um, decided on a contract to, to, to make it happen. And it took a period, I would say, of um, a year, a little over a year, to convert that gym into a hangar. Um, so we have small planes that fit inside, not like a big Delta jetliner, but, but small planes that fit inside of it. Um, so it was, it was a great, great thing. Um, additionally, um, Mr. Ballard, our facilities um, director um, under my supervision, uh, he prepares and we review each month uh, two reports, our uh, facilities and maintenance report and our renovation and construction report. And those reports provide um, details on um, the SPLOS projects and the status report. And we're looking for two things on those reports. We're looking for them to come in on budget, and on time, I'm, so, I'm sorry, under budget and on time. That's what we look for, um, under budget and on time. So that's key. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Dr. Warren. I'm Erica Watkins Smith, representative uh, for District 7. Yes, ma'am. Describe for me your management style and the methods you have found to be most effective in supervision and building rapport with administrators and employees. Okay. Um, effective management is, is key for any organization to, to meet their vision and mission. Um, 
effective managers have a, a huge impact on employees, employees' uh, productivity uh, and retention r rates as well. I think a, a manager is important to because they organize, they plan, they communicate, they strategize with with the uh, with the employees. Um, as a leader, I have a diplomatic leadership style, which lends itself to um, conflict resolution and, and building relationships. And relationship building is key so that we can merge um, various and multiple agendas into one towards a common goal. Um, as a manager, I have a participated management style. I'm a big believer in we. Um, through our synergy, we can get a better product working together collaboratively than I can alone. Because, you know, Donald, I might mess some stuff up, but we all get together working on stuff. We'll come up with a better project working together. So um, have a participated management style. Um, I have 23 years of uh, administrative experience at the school level and district level. So um, management-wise, um, I've done a lot. I'm still not perfect, I'm, it's just work in progress. But I will say that I'm comfortable in switching between various leadership styles and management styles. Um, one thing that I believe in is um, setting the pace, being an example to set the pace. And when I say pace, that's the acronym for the following. It's the acronym for me and others to be professional at all times. A is for be accountable at all times. And the C and E are to communicate effectively at all times. Um, that's what I hold myself and others to. To share with you a specific example of my participated management style, as um, deputy superintendent, I was charged with um, guiding the efforts to develop our new five-year strategic plan for our district, which will guide our work for the next five years, our priorities and whatnot. And um, it would also result in a new vision, mission, and beliefs. Okay, it's the core of everything we are as a school district. So of course we um, consulted with the Georgia School Board Association, and they joined with us as well. Um, we also um, invited 40 um, external stakeholders to serve on various committees. We had representation from our employees as well, uh, district office, elementary school, middle school as well, talking about certified and classified as well. It's very, very key to get the input of your classified staff. You can't forget about those individuals. They, they contribute mildly to a school district. So my role was to coordinate those efforts. We had um, different committees. We had a planning committee. We had an action team committee. And I had goal area champions that headed up the, the various committees. And um, over a period of months, I would say uh, it really started in February. We got approved in December. So that was like, what's that, 10 months? that process happened. Um, where there were meetings were taking place, uh, different committees, um, task forces. Uh, we reviewed data, um, current student achievement data, other metrics, um, perception data from uh, internal and external stakeholders. And um, as, a, as different committees, we put together um, draft initiatives, performance objectives, metrics and things of that nature, action steps. And there was a lot of give and take, a lot of dialogue and discussion. I remember one sticking point was, do we want to have culture as a whole separate goal area? And we decided not to because that would be sort of hard to capture. But what we decided to do was to ingrain culture in the other four goal areas for us. Um, so uh, in the end, we came up with the final product that we felt pretty satisfied with. And my role was to reconvene their entire body, about 80, 80 individuals I presented to them got their feedback and their, buy, their buy-in. And the following week, I was able to present at our, to our Board of Education the, the uh, brand new strategic plan, our strategy map, our brand new vision, mission, and beliefs. And of course, uh, at a midway point, I did give the Board of Education an update at a work session to keep them in the loop. So they were not just, we didn't just bring it on them. But um, that's an example of where I use my uh, participated management style to, to tackle a pretty, pretty big project. You're welcome. You're welcome. Good evening. Yes, ma'am. I am Brenda Coleman. Yes, ma'am. And I am the representative from District 3. Mm -hmm. My question has to do with eliminating achievement gaps, a topic that has been very widely discussed and debated. 
Recognizing that learners do have varying abilities, what are your expectations for student achievement? And what approaches would you pursue to narrow gaps as they relate to gender, race, and socioeconomic differences? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, that's a great question. It is incumbent upon us to, to, to narrow the achievement gaps to ensure each student can maximize his or her potential. Um, related to instruction, my instructional vision is for um, high leverage instructional practices to be used in every classroom that allow students to read, write, speak, and solve on grade level. It's not rocket science, it's just high level instructional practices that allow students to read, write, speak on grade level. Um, my theory of action is the following. First of all, it needs to be um, a lockstep unison and agreement between the Board of Education and superintendent. Uh, research shows that um, where that's in place, where the Board of Superintendent and the, uh, I'm sorry, the superintendent and the Board of Education are on the same page, you have higher um, student achievement results, okay? Um, I believe at the district office, we need to provide um, clarity and cohesion and support to schools because basically you either work in a school to support those that do. So that's what we need to do. Um, on the central office, I think it's critically important for there to be um, principal supervisors that support principals in being instructional leaders, okay? Um, I remember, remember my days as a principal, it's sort of like being a, a doctor in the emergency room. You don't know what's gonna come through that door. You can have, you know, I'm gonna spend two hours in this, PL, uh, in this PLC session, I'm gonna observe these classrooms, observe these teachers, and meet with a parent, and if something pops off in the building, then your whole schedule is, is, is gone. So it's important that we work with our principals so they can be better instructional leaders. That principal, he or she is a face and leader organization, so we need to support and develop their leadership and their capacity. In each classroom, again, each teacher needs to be providing a high leverage instructional practice to our students. Um, we gotta coach them up. Um, if, if someone is not meeting the mark, we need to decide if it's a lack of skill or a lack of will. If it's lack of skill, we can come up with a plan of support or a professional development plan to, to get you where you need to be at. If you're willing to work with us and meet us halfway, um, you cannot fire everyone. You gotta be able to be willing to work with individuals. If it's lack of will, then it's a whole nother conversation that we need to address to hold people accountable. Um, in the end, all that to say that in the classroom, it all funnels down towards each individual student. So that student receives high quality instruction, catered to his or her strengths and weaknesses, um, good standard based instruction in every classroom. We're, uh, assess, uh, we're using high leverage assessment strategies. Instruction is differentiated based on student needs. Uh, we let the data drive our decision making. And the school building as well needs to be strong PLCs, professional learning communities, so that teachers can collaborate together and solve problem or practice to increase student achievement. Uh, I will also say that along with standards based instruction, that's gonna cover about 80% of your students. There needs to be a strong um, MTSS program, multi-tier um, support system to provide research-based appropriate interventions uh, to students in a timely fashion. So all that goes into um, raising achievement levels as well as closing achievement gaps. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. An additional question. Mm -hmm. When a new superintendent is hired, we want to make certain that the transition is as smooth as possible for everyone involved. How would you help both the educational community and the community at large to adjust to a new governing style that comes with the new leadership? Um, I can say that I'm not prepared walking to MTS as superintendent to say I have all the answers to, to cure the ills of MTS at M Montgomery Public Schools. I'll need to walk in, spend some time, um, go on listening learning tours, meet with various stakeholder groups, both internal and external, get their thoughts, perceptions, aspirations of the school district, do some deep data dives, figure out exactly what's going on. So um, first of all, I wanna commend um, the board and Dr. Moore for the work they've done. I think she's done a remarkable job in her, in her tenure here. 
I had a pleasure meeting her this afternoon. Dr. Coleman took me by the, by the district office. Um, done a phenomenal job, but I definitely would like to uh, pick up brain, so to speak, so we can keep the momentum moving forward. But again, um, getting out and meeting with folks, having those listening and learning tours, um, because I, I don't have all the answers initially. It, it takes us working together to do some root cause um, analysis, um, having some candid, open and honest discussions, some critical conversations, and make some decisions with data being our guide. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Dr. Good evening. Uh, I'm Claudia Mitchell, mm. and I represent District 6. Yes, ma'am. What are your ideas about engaging families and the community, particularly when they are inexperienced with participating or if they've had negative experiences with education? Mm. Yes. Um, unfortunately, that, that is true. Um, I remember vividly back in my senior year of high school, um, my mother felt uncomfortable engaging with a, a group of teachers that this sponsored club I was in. Um, and we were able to work through that. But yeah, that, is, that is true. Some parents feel uneasy associating with teachers, and educators that is, I should say, administrators. So that, that's always been in the back of my mind um, because we need to um, be a team um, school district, community, and parents working together to benefit students. If we can all get engaged on the same page, then um, we can be, uh, they can be a big ally to a school district, and uh, they can be the biggest champions to support and advance student achievement. Um, as a principal at Wallace Middle School, um, we were really, really big on parent conferences, contacting parents, um, having curriculum nights to inform parents of the academics going on at the school. Um, we had a very, very active uh, PTO, parent-teacher organization. We also had an active school council. By law, in Georgia, each school has a school council. We had, uh, our members consisted of uh, me as the head of it, as principal, and we also had um, teachers, parents, and business partners on there, on, on the school council. Um, also, at the district level, I've been involved in um, several initiatives to um, work with the, the community and whatnot. And a couple of my, I mentioned to you, I don't know about Alabama, but in Georgia, and Britain in particular, our student achievement, had, our student attendance has suffered as a result of the attendance. Sometimes teachers don't want to come to school, and that's something we have to, to, to address. So what we're doing is I'm coordinating a, a um, faith leader summit on attendance to, to meet with our clergy in Griffin, Spalding County, to uh, inform them of our attendance issues, inform them of our initiatives, so we want that information to cascade down into their congregation to get their support. So many of their congregants are, are, are our parents and students and whatnot. So we want to get them on our side to support that. Um, also, we're very, very fortunate in our school district to have um, mental health clinicians and mental health school counselors. Um, the clinicians come from a, a previous grant that expired, um, but the district saw fit our board to provide funding to keep the clinicians on board. We have three of them. We also have mental, school, mental um, health school counselors in our middle schools that I wrote a memo for a couple of years ago for that funding. Um, but that team and I, we coordinate um, a monthly family education webinar series online where we provide resources to parents, um, mental health resources that is for parents to, to support their kids at home. So we're looking at parents being aware of positive um, mental health issues for the students, how they can provide aid as a parent, and also positive self-esteem. The further issue then, again, at school, students have access to mental health support in, the, in their school buildings. So that's something we're proud of. Um, also, I mentioned our College Drury Academy. We're very, very active in um, providing tours of the academy to our students as we transition from um, middle school to high school. Also, our elementary kids, let them see, hey, what's in store down the road to hook those elementary students. Also, our community at large, we want to showcase our, our college, career, college and career academy. So they come out and we, and we showcase our different pathways, be it aviation, welding, film production, and healthcare. Also, two other things. Um, we're in, a, a, in the middle of a campaign to recruit our private school families back to Griffin Spalding. 
by showing them um, the good things happening in the classroom with our teachers and students. And uh, hopefully we get some funding soon. I think we're gonna make it happen where we can make some videos, so for, uh, really some infomercials, for lack of a better word, of teachers and students in action, showing the wonderful things taking place to, to re-recruit those parents back into our school district and families. And lastly, I will say that if I am selected your superintendent, I mentioned earlier, I'll be going on a series of listen and learn tours around Montgomery with different um, stakeholder groups to get the idea of uh, what we can do. One of the things I'll, I would like to do um, is meet with just me, myself, meet with a group of students that left Montgomery Public Schools without graduating. You know, get some pizza, get some sodas, have lunch with them, just sit down and talk. What's on their mind? What can we do differently if you graduate and get your diploma? What, what, we, what could we have done? So, you know, here's to tell you. You just gotta be um, wise enough, bold enough to, to seek their input and ask them. And I tell my friend, we, we may not be able to do everything you, you like, but we can have some conversation discussion, some of what we can do. Um, so those are the things I would do to engage families in the, in the community at large. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Dr. Warren, describe your ability to cultivate a disciplined, safe, and orderly school environment and support teachers in terms of discipline issues. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, discipline is important. If um, it's due in the classroom, not much learning is going to take place. <laughs> then you're going to get a bad name in the, in the, in the public, and it's just a, a vicious cycle. Um, first of all, one thing that we do in Griffin, uh, we give our kids a behavior screening um, twice a year. In, in the, um, we do it in the fall. I think we do it again, maybe February, behavior screening, to try to figure out what's going on with kids um, who ha who's exhibiting um, external and ex internal and external um, behaviors. And from that, our mental health clinicians can, can consult and have a small group session to, to support those students. But also, um, I want to come in and check and see um, what type of positive behavior in, um, intervention system is in place in Montgomery Public Schools. So we, we teach kids to model for kids proper behavior and reward kids for that. I've seen that pay dividends uh, elementary level, middle school level, as well as, well as high school level. I can think um, Griffin High School, a school of 1,500 um, student of the month activities. Um, you know, we give kids um, points for behaving properly, for doing things properly, so it's not punitive, it's, it's, it's a reward system. It sounds, you know, um, childish or corny, but it works, and we, it gets them to exhibit the behavior, the proper behavior that we, we desire for them to have. Also, um, to support a safe and orderly environment, schools need to have clear expectations and policies, and that's a big part of PBIS, that's, um, that students and parents are well, well informed of, that's posted along the building, that students are held accountable for, uh, where the discipline is in, this, in, a, in a fair, firm, and consistent fashion. Fair, firm, and consistent, three important words to um, having great discipline in the school building, in the school system as a whole. Also, one thing we gotta do is monitor the data. You gotta monitor um, the kids that are your high flyers coming to office, which probably be easy for administrators to, to determine, but you also gotta monitor, you know, who, who's sending us these kids, what type of referrals are we receiving so we can figure out um, who on our, our faculty and staff needs some, some professional learning, some guidance, some support to help them be a relationship better with kids so they can exhibit, exhibit proper behavior. So those are a, a multitude of things I would do, but that, that data is important. Um, the, the numbers don't lie, so to speak. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Dr. Warren. I'm Lisa Keith. I represent District 1. Good evening. I have uh, one question only, but it happens to be long, and I do have a couple of clarification questions. One is just a one answer only thing on a couple other ones. First, um, glasses. Uh, how have you held staff members accountable for student achievement while balancing the demands put on teachers? There's a A, B, and C to that. Mm -hmm. A is how have you measured the staff's performance? B, what obstacles have you faced and how did you handle those obstacles? And C is what measures have you used that are outside of test scores if needed? Yes, ma'am. Um, 
Uh, it was a doozy. <laughs> I'll try to tackle it and get my thoughts together. Um, yeah, staff accountability and student achievement. Um, I can think of a, a situation where uh, during my previous role as executive director of secondary education, um, where again, I supervised the middle and high school principals in our district, um, we implemented a brand new curriculum um, for my TNL department, my teacher learning department, and it was aligned to our state standards. And um, my, my role was to um, support principals and their faculty and staff to implement the um, curriculum with fidelity. So um, what, 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 I, what, I, what happened um, to accomplish that, you gotta be in the classroom to be aware of what's going on. Um, I conducted classroom observations side by side with the principal. Um, we went into classrooms to do classroom observations. And when, we, we, when we went in, we were looking at three things, instructional practices, uh, assessment strategies, as well as a positive learning environment. Those are three things that we look for. Um, you mentioned obstacles. Some um, obstacles that we encountered along the way were um, the teacher angst, a little bit of anxiety for having a brand new curriculum, and also um, lack of parent awareness because it was brand new. Um, some of the data that we included was uh, survey results from teachers on their professional learning needs, so we can cater professional learning um, to different um, school builders and teachers based upon the data. Also, um, some of the data we looked at was um, um, unit assessment data. They taught this particular unit. Um, the, the unit assessment was standard across the district. So if they taught, say, um, in mathematics, seventh grade math, unit one, then there was a standard um, unit assessment at the end we gave district-wide. So we got a good picture of how, of how all of our kids were performing and there were pretty rigorous to make certain kids knew the content. Um, that data was analyzed um, by um, individual school level, by grade band, meaning we looked at all the elementary data together. Then we looked at all the middle school, all the high school, and also as a district as a whole. So that gave us a plethora of data points to look at to determine PR needs and things of that nature. Um, some of the action that we took, we, um, again, developed professional learning sessions, supported schools in developing their plans to provide PO to teachers. To tackle the, um, the lack of parent awareness, we developed um, online uh, parent resource guides, and we posted those on our line. They, they were very, very strong. Matter of fact, I remember using the one in geometry to um, tutor my son at home in geometry, and I live in Henry County, but working with Griffin. They were just that strong because they were all aligned to state standards, okay? Um, we also supported schools to um, host curriculum nights, so said parents coming out showcasing curriculum. And to get that hook, we had you know, some students perform, even you know, high school. Um, Griffin has a great course, they perform, a little drama rendition. So um, it's pretty, pretty well attended. You never get as many parents come out as you want to, but, but we made the effort, and those that came really, really benefited from it. Um, the result of that, you know, um, before the testing, we were able to take a, a year of the Georgia milestone, which is our state testing, and uh, it did show some improvement. Um, and most, most importantly, um, the CCRPI that I mentioned, the, the Georgia school grading system, uh, for elementary, middle, and high school, combined, there were 13 metrics, and I'm proud to say that uh, based on the curriculum implementation and, and the support uh, that we did in our district, we improved in 10 of those 13 metrics when you look at across elementary, middle, and high school. And we didn't forget about teachers. Our classroom observations, um, we looked at six standards. In, in Georgia, there's this thing called Teacher Keys Evaluation System, and it's Leader Keys Evaluation System. And um, for teachers, there's like six, there's like 10 standards, but in the classroom observation that we did, we, we only looked at um, six of them. The other ones, you know, you really couldn't tell by classroom observation, there were things happening in PLCs and things of that nature outside of our purview in the classroom. But on the six standards that we looked at, from the start to the end of the school year, um, each standard, the, the percentage of teachers rated proficient 
improved anywhere from five to 12 percentage points. So we, we were very, very pleased um, with that. And, and this year, we've taken a step further with Dr. Simmons, our superintendent. We've instituted um, quarterly performance reviews where each principal comes and they, they meet with um, the senior cabinet members and our curriculum team, and they give us a, a status check on how things are going with them implementing their school improvement plan. Um, you know, what's going well, what's not going so well, and the data is our guide. It's not like I think or I feel, it's, it's the data is our guide. So um, it's some great dialogue and discussion at that meeting. So when that meeting is over, um, the principal leaves with a plan of support that he or she can implement in his or her school building to uh, make, ensure things are on the right track, ensuring that we get the desired outcome for student achievement and um, teaching as well. And the principal supervisor is a part of that meeting as well. That's a very, very important um, role player in our district. We have two, one elementary level, one secondary level, the principal supervisor. Um, there, in all those performance reviews for the particular level, they work hand in hand on putting that plan of support together and work with that principal to ensure that it's implemented with fidelity. So each quarter we, we um, come back and we do that. Okay, these are very short answer clarifications. One on number two, just did I hear you correctly? You said, as I think you look close to Atlanta, but you mentioned aviation was, and I know we have an airport here too. Do you, do you have classes in aviation or is that? We have class in aviation, yes ma'am. Okay, that's just interesting. That's yes, an interesting idea. I hope yeah. Montgomery might yeah. consider that. And also, I'm fair to say this, we are, um, you know, um, if, being from Atlanta, they have an FFA office. Uh, being close to Atlanta in proximity to Atlanta Airport, which is one of the biggest in this in the world, they have an FFA office, and their representatives came down and they worked hand in hand with us to make that happen, to write grants as well. Um, for, for equipment, majority of the equipment was purchased through our Perkins funds and other um, grant sources from the state for CTAE. Um, but also, um, that FFA, FFA liaison is putting us in, in contact with um, some of the role players at some of the major airlines. So actually, uh, one of them is Delta, working on a partnership with Delta. Uh, it, had, hadn't came to, it has not came to fruition yet, but we feel that will be happening this year. So Delta will be a part of that school because their, their workforce is hurting. It's hurting. Okay. So they want people ready to work and um, they're gonna throw in some money and signage and hey, yeah. what kid would refuse that? Highly interesting. The yeah. last two are on number six. Um, and, and again, this is just sort of yes, no. Did I hear you say you had a teacher attendance problem? No, ma'am. I said we have a, a student attendance problem. Student attendance, because I knew you said something about yes. faith. Okay, gotcha. Yes, and we'll work okay. student attendance problem. Gotcha. The last one for clarifications, you said that you wanted to meet with, um, possibly meet with school dropouts to kind of get an idea of what they were thinking. Mm -hmm. I would assume that since you are, are thinking about that, you would have done that before. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, do you have any thing to say about what your, the other people, have, what, what dropouts have, have something to bring with you that other dropouts have said that we could, that could have kept them in the school? Yes, done it once before. Um, and um, one of the main things that we get is a lack of relationship. Every kid really needs a champion in the building, a relationship. Um, also, um, working through certain situations like um, pregnancy, that's been an issue for us. Um, um, work, having to work to support home and family. So working through issues like that. Thank you. So, yes, ma'am. So, now that we have all the answers, we're, we're trying to make an attempt at it. Okay, hello again, Dr. Warren, yes, Jana Bailey. Um, my question is, how have you engaged your district with the community? And how have you increased the visibility of your school? Um, the school and its system when it, with its needs as how to convey that to the community and how they can be a part of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Increased visibility. Um, you know, it, it's productive and, and, and a positive for the school district to have a relationship with the community. It's mutually beneficial for all stakeholders involved. Um, 
I think we need to focus on having open lines of, of communication as well as collaboration. Uh, so that engagement is, is crucial. Um, two words that I think about is um, economic vitality. It's important to both the city and, and the county. Uh, very, very important. Uh, that was drilled into us in Houston County because um, in Houston County, we are the largest employer of the state, Robbins Air Force Base, um, about 3,700 employees. And when I became principal, I, I received a, like a little mini lesson in economics. And I remember being called down to Superintendent's office, Donald, you know, you're principal when I was middle school, and I want you to know, you know, we really need you to do well there. Um, our district, we want to maintain our standard of excellence, and um, any support you need, we're here for you. The demographics are going to change. They did change, as I mentioned earlier, and another, another question I'd answer. But I would say they put that money where their mouth was to give us the resources needed to be successful um, because it's all, it all ties together. You know, a great school system um, produces jobs. It kept that base there so that other bases in other parts of the country were closed, and, and we received those families that turned increased our enrollment. Um, then you have a housing market that, 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 that flourishes as well, a new subdivision, new homes being built, businesses open. So it's just, you know, it, it all, it's, it's all tied together. It's all tied together. Um, some things that I've been involved in, I mentioned the, the strategic plan earlier, why I involved 40 plus community members. Also, in addition, we have a, a zero to five initiative that we've involved the community. And that zero to five initiative is from like zero years of age to five years of age. It's pretty much a, um, we, where we partner with preschool programs in our, our district, um, in, in the city, uh, parents in the hospital to increase kindergarten readiness. That's some of the things we do. Um, also, one of the things we do, um, we have a peer court, brand new peer court we're about to get kicked up. And that's a, through a partnership with our local district attorney where a kid is charged with misdemeanor will go to a peer court and be um, judged, for lack of a better word, by a court of the peers. Uh, only for misdemeanors to only be um, once a month in the evening. But that was a, a brainstorm a revelation between myself, our um, academy CEO, and our local district attorney, just through relationships in, over the um, last couple of weeks. Um, we, that, we hope, will put a dent in our school to prison pipeline in, in Griffin Spalding. But one thing I want to share with you about uh, invisibility, um, high visibility is the following you know, situation. Um, I think it's an example of how you know, bad things are going to happen, but it's how you respond to them that will dictate if you, make, you can take um, lemons and make lemonade, so to speak. Um, in the, in the, and this happened right before I was interim superintendent. I remember asking Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, you sure you don't want to stay and hang around and help us out with this? But um, at a high school, one of, our, one of our high schools, there was a, a forceful arrest of two students. And um, it was videotape, kid got on videotape and put it on social media and the rest is history. It was on Channel 2 News in Atlanta. It actually made some national news as well. Um, so we were, I was thinking, you know, how, we were thinking, how, how can we deal with this? How can we tackle this? So we decided to have a team in law enforcement town hall, okay? Um, so I, I met with some representatives from the um, Sheriff's Department and the um, police department that supplies our SROs, and they were on board with it. They saw the value of it. And then I had to get the students involved, because they're a big part of it, get those students involved. So I went to all of our three high schools, me and, and Mr. Pugh. Mr. Pugh is our executive director of communications and partnership. So we've been with the, um, the school counselors from each of the schools, and they really liked the idea as well. They saw the value of it. Um, they were willing to participate in it, so it was great. They helped us plan it. We went about making the plans. We hosted it. And due to, due to the pandemic, we couldn't um, have a full house because this was like in um, January 21 when we had it. So the, it was raging. Matter of fact, students were home then with the pandemic. I was the interim superintendent. Um, but we did stream it live to our families to, so they can see it. And, um, we think that the law enforcement town hall was, was a big, big success. Um, it consisted of um, a question and answer session where students could submit questions um, ahead of time online, and the law enforcement authorities there um, responded. So everyone 
uh, was informed how to properly interact with law enforcement. Additionally, it included role playing. You know, our chief of police and our sheriff, they actually role play, you know, here's how you respond if you pulled over for a ticket for speeding, or, or, or traffic violation, whatnot. Here's how you respond if, if you're walking down the street and a police officer asks you something, here's how you respond. So um, those officers modeling for kids and in the audience online, and in school we had conversations about it as well. That was a, a big, big um, dividend. What I want them to walk away with was a lifelong lesson. You know, based upon me watching that town hall, or participating in it, for the rest of my life, I know how to positively interact with the authorities. So that won't happen again. Knock on wood, <laughs> we have not had any more uh, situations in, in Griffin with forceful arrests of that type with our SROs. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So um, what are some things that you would like to accomplish in the first 100 days as the superintendent of Montgomery Public School System? Yes, ma'am. Well, I think I can just go over some highlights of, I have a 100-day entry plan that I prepared, and I'll just share some, some information with you, submit briefly. I have a copy of each of the board members okay. for your perusal. Um, I understand the expectations of the superintendent from the, the leadership profile that was put out by the Alabama School Board Association. And um, I've broken it down to five parts. Again, I don't know all the answers, but I know how to come in and, and meet with folks, interact with folks to um, get boots on the ground and figure out what's going on and work collaboratively with people to um, do some problem solving. First thing I want to do is um, establish relationships will be goal one with the government's team, with, with, with you ladies, um, to develop a strong collaborative relationship with individual board members and the board members as a whole, their student focus. So you and I can um, have a cohesive framework for working together and things of that nature. See, and, I, and I listed uh, four steps, four actions that I would take with you all for that. Um, goal two relates to um, increasing effectiveness. Um, it's goal two is uh, organizational capacity and alignment to increase organizational effectiveness and efficiency to support schools. It's all about supporting schools so the principal can be the best instructor leader he or she can be. That's the only way you're gonna move that needle when it comes to student achievement. Um, so for this I have um, the district's office work must be aligned with the strategic plan to produce maximum outputs and provide folks and high quality support to schools. This will result in an enriching educational experience for all students. We want them to come to school and have a positive school experience in, in MPS. So increasing effectiveness. And I have um, 10 actions that you'll read outlined for this. And the first one is to meet with Dr. Moore. Again, I met with today. Uh, kudos to the work she's done. Meet with Dr. Moore and district office personnel who also met with to discuss their area of responsibility, review any major initiatives, challenges and any upcoming major decisions needed. And number two is to um, meet with the Alabama Department of Education personnel regarding any, any expectations um, to maintain our independence. So I have um, eight other initiatives um, mentioning um, looking at the org chart to see if the organizational chart supports our strategic plan, um, looking at um, analyzing the current FY22 district and school level budgets and planning ahead for the FY23 budgets. I think you all on the, the federal budget calendar running um, October 1st to September 30th, I believe it is. Whereas in Georgia, we're on a different calendar. Ours run um, July 1st to June 30th. So it's, that's something that we, I can overcome. Um, lastly, on here, um, review the planning for the 22-23 school year. Um, that's, that has started to be ready for a safe and productive first day of school and week, including COVID-19 protocols, and develop processes for monitoring the effect in, effectiveness of our opening of schools. Okay, um, I'm just about done. The, the next is student achievement, goal three, to understand current strategies, strengths, and opportunities for improvement in the district's teaching learning programs. 
There are five action steps associated with this. Um, all of our work should be focused on increased student achievement. We need to be driven to relentlessly increase our graduation rate and produce students that are both college career ready. Our next one, um, community engagement, goal four, to engage the community and public, to meet with community, post-secondary, political, parent organizations, to learn community perspectives, generate goodwill, build support. There are nine actions associated with this, including identifying uh, the mayor, commissioners, which I met two of them today, city council, key business leaders, as well as U.S. Air Force liaisons and law enforcement. I know th those individuals are key from um, being in Houston County. It has a big, again, Air Force presence. Also, um, work with the media to invite them to key events as well. Um, lastly, um, culture and climate, just about done, bear with me. There are um, eight actions in this culture and climate with the goal is to maintain a positive district culture focused on teamwork to maximize teacher and learning. Um, Want to work to maintain positive relationship between district leadership and all central and, and school level personnel. Um, everyone has a role to play. It needs to be validated as we progress towards our vision. So there are um, eight actions in this culture and climate. I just highlight a couple. Um, Meet administrators um, right off the bat, teacher organizations, student organizations. I mentioned me with the former group of students. Um, reviewing discipline um, data, reviewing attendance data for both students and teachers, reviewing teacher, reten uh, teacher retention data trends, you know? Um, so we can support that principle to, to keep, uh, prevent a mass exodus of teachers every year, because when they leave, you pretty much are starting over uh, each year, unfortunately. Um, visiting schools to establish a relationship with school faculty and staff, and um, very important, uh, you know, hosting town hall meetings, but also um, review the mental health support for both um, students and employees. Um, you hear about mental health, and it, it is a real issue uh, for students and adults. Due to this pandemic, it just brought it to another level, unfortunately. So what I'd like to do is take a look at what, what type of mental supports do we have at all for our students, as well as our employees, take a look at the employee assistance program to be certain that uh, we can keep our employees um, supported so they can um, produce maximum output. So those are some of the things that I would do um, in my first 100 days um, here if I'm selected as your superintendent. Again, I have copies that, that I can um, share a gift to each, each board member. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So we have a couple of minutes left. Um, in, in these two minutes, is there anything else, additional information that you would like to share with this board? And if you have any questions for us, now is the time. I see, I see. I'll just say that, um, you know, I'm a living witness to education's great, super, uh, great equalizer. A young man come from the wrong side of tracks in Cordell, Georgia. Right, here I am, able to um, go through school and um, have a measure of success. Not that I've totally arrived, but um, it's all because of the, the, in the value of a good education instilled in me by my mother and, and grandfather who couldn't maximize their, their academic potential because of, of the time. Um, my father, my grandfather was a sharecropper actually in, in, in Georgia, in Fiona, Georgia, Dooley County, Georgia. Um, but they instilled in me hard work and to uh, value education, and I'm duty bound to instill that same passion into students and people I work with because, you know, our, our kids are at stake. We can make a big, big difference. Um, in, in closing, I'd like to say, um, before I, I do have a question too, but you have an important decision to make and who will be your next leader. Um, I hope I've earned the opportunity to, to take that journey with you in your new day. Uh, those are very nice videos y'all made about a new day in MPS. Uh, I, I was encouraged and motivated by that. Um, I'll say though, if you look for someone who's gonna establish strong and collaborative relationships with the board, district, and school leaders, I'm that leader. If you look for someone who's gonna work relentlessly to make certain that schools receive the support they need in an effective, efficient manner, I'm that leader. If you want Someone that's going to raise student achievement using research-based strategies, I'm that leader. If you want someone who's going to engage various community stakeholder groups, um, 
not be afraid to meet with them, discuss their, their aspirations for the district. I'm that leader. If you want someone who's going to work relentless for you and really has a heart for people, is not afraid of hard work, that really sincerely believes that education is great equalizer, I'm that leader. And I would love to have the opportunity to um, be that leader for you as superintendent of MPS. And I want to thank you for having me here this evening. And today, it's been a wonderful day. Learned a lot, saw some um, good things in different schools. I recall Dr. Taylor this morning over at Goodwin Middle School, the first school we went to. Went over to Floyd, then to um, Impact. Saw some great things going on here in Montgomery. There's work, improvements to be made in every school district. And I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and make that happen here in MPS. Thank you. He had one question? Yes, yes, I do. Um, my question, um, what do you feel is the greatest challenge as a board to, our, to our, your school district, number one, and what's the greatest asset um, of your school district? <clears throat> to me, the greatest asset are the staff members from central office all the way down mm -hmm. to the custodial bus drivers that come in every day mm -hmm. um, and the service they provide, that's our greatest asset, mm -hmm. is that, you know, we have all been through challenging times, obviously, and they continue to show up and do their jobs. And I think you saw that in the schools today. Everybody has a smile on their face, and um, I won't say every day is rainbows and unicorns, but mm -hmm. for the most part, um, you know, we have a great system and just at a crossroads, and we're looking for that right person to mm -hmm. take that next step. Yes, ma'am. And I would agree that, that our people mm -hmm. are our assets. Our challenges, so many of our challenges have been removed. Mm -hmm. This board, and this board has worked tirelessly with the current superintendent to take care of old business. We have got a clean slate as a superintendent coming in here you don't have to worry about the money. You don't have to worry about uh, monies that have gone missing. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about accreditation because it's taken completely care of. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to worry about the budgets not being correct. They are balanced and on time. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the challenges that were here a few years ago have gone. I think this is a great opportunity for our next superintendent to walk in and be able to really take our children to the next level. And that's, I think, what the expectation is, mm -hmm. that we take our children to a new level, a higher expectation, mm -hmm. to have the world be theirs mm -hmm. for the taking. Yes, ma'am. Thank you all. Thank you. I, think, I think our greatest asset is the, some of the leadership that we have, especially, I would say, on the board, in that we, we want so much to continue to progress. Mm -hmm. One of our deficits is we forever live a reputation of we're doing the same old, same old. Mm -hmm. And there, I don't know, I don't think it was Ben Franklin, I forget, but it was somebody in that zone that said the definition of insanity <laughs> is when you do something right. over and over again and expect change. Right. So, so oh, Einstein, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, so, you know, and I, as, in order to be consistent with all people that I've spoke with, you know, don't get the candidates, I, I do want change. We've got some great leaders, but we have, if we continue to use the same leadership over and over and over and mm -hmm. over, you just come in, sit down and go, okay, this is it. Mm -hmm. We're gonna, we want, I won't change. And yeah. the, we, we have the money like our president has said, because we just did a tax referendum. Mm -hmm. But um, we, we want student achievement. We want to raise the bar. Mm -hmm. We haven't done that yet. So I, I would like to see change in, especially us raise the bar in student achievement and discipline as well. So. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but uh, the human resources are definitely our, our asset. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to include even the students in those assets. Mm -hmm. We have young people who are engaging with their teachers mm -hmm. and they're actually doing what we're asking them to do. Yeah. 
So I'd like, you know, for our administrators, our teachers, our support staff, and our children to know that they are all extremely valuable to us and they are definitely the asset that will help to move this system forward mm -hmm. uh, as we work collectively. And I think that might even play into the deficit. Uh, I think there are some systemic barriers and I think we might need to do some in-depth systems analyses mm -hmm. in order to determine uh, how to come out of some of the problems that we have seen uh, when we talk about the, the way we're perceived mm -hmm. in the public, um, to, to change those images, but more than an image, to change how we treat our children, how we treat our professionals, how we treat the workers, and even how we treat our parents. Mm -hmm. We need to do some deep dives into our systems and, mm -hmm. and grow those. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank I'm, you for your question. I, I must echo mm -hmm. uh, what has been said. Uh, our people in Montgomery are our greatest asset. Mm -hmm. the, the, the teachers, the staff, and the students. Mm -hmm. And also, I must echo change. We are at the prefaces where we're, we want to prepare our students for the 21st century. Mm -hmm. uh, COVID, along with many other things, have, have changed mm -hmm. uh, how we educate. Mm -hmm. And we want our students to be prepared to go to the next level. I always say that when, when I was in school, we, we received grades for finding information, mm -hmm. but our students today have information overload, mm -hmm. and we have to teach in a new way. Mm -hmm. Teachers have to become facilitators of learning, right. teaching students how to think and solve problems. So we're looking for innovative new ways, thinking outside the box, you know, uh, teaching students how to think and mm -hmm. become problem solvers right. because they are going to have a lot of new things that need to be invented. We need to look at things that are going different ways. So we want student achievement where it looks like our students know how to be mm -hmm. thinkers and problem solvers. Yes, sir. I'll just add my two cents. Yes, <laughs> and innovation is definitely a deficit and I think that it needs to be addressed. And without the level of innovation and engagement that it's gonna require, um, we will not prosper. But I, I will not think of us not prospering. Mm -hmm. I think with new leaders and engagement of our wonderful staff we already have in place, mm -hmm. there's nothing that we can do but get better and move ahead. Mm -hmm. And so I am personally excited about the opportunity of present change. Mm -hmm. And whoever our leader is, I think that my fellow board members and I are prepared to hold them accountable mm -hmm. and make that change happen and make our children's dreams come true. Mm -hmm. and to make our kids feel like they are the leaders of all leaders. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. what I get excited about, and that's what my expectations are. Okay, thank you. And last but not least, huh? <laughs> uh, our greatest achievement is really what everybody has already stated. Um, our community, in addition to all of our wonderful staff, I mean, supporting us through an avalorm during a time of intervention mm -hmm. shows that there's a lot of trust and we are doing something right. So there, and, and the things that were mentioned are the things that we've done right. Our greatest challenge is really holding on to that retention, creating that good culture and climate within mm -hmm. our schools and building up morale. Mm -hmm. and, and having an open door policy where val voices are valued mm -hmm. and um, included in decision making is something that I think that we yes, should continue to work on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Thank you all. Okay, with that, we uh, will conclude this interview. Again, I invite our audience to come into the foyer and enjoy some refreshments made by the culinary arts kids. And uh, we are adjourned. Thank you. I do want to pass out.